as we've discussed before, China is really uh, the big driver of demand. And it's the central bank, but it's also uh, individuals. And we saw a uh, increase in demand um, during the stock market um, drop uh, of last year. I think the volatility scared a few people away. Um, lots of retail came in uh, at wrong prices in the stock market and got hurt. Okay. And the interest rates there are quite low compared to what they're used to. The overnight rate is about 2% and uh, you know, maybe a percent of the government bonds there uh, are around, you know, 2.7 or so in the five year. And so people there, that's not, that's not what they're used to. Um, and so I think we did have a move into gold. The Chinese economy has been very weak. And you can see here the China, a Chinese uh, proprietary economic index that we put together has a very strong correlation. Again, I love looking at these correlations because over time they really tell you a lot. You can see here that the, econ the economic index is back to where it was in 08. Again, it's funny how many different assets or charts that we've looked at are back to where we were in 08. Again, uh, before the, the Deutsche Bank price being one of them. And you can see here that the five-year Chinese government bond could actually drop quite a bit if the correlation were going to stay okay. tighter. And of course, it makes sense. Their economy is weak. They have an overvalued uh, exchange rate. If you look at the RMB, real effective exchange rate, we look at an 18 month rolling average here just to show you how much it's gone up. And I think this has been a big negative shock. Again, it's pegged to the dollar. The dollar's had a very big move against many different currencies. And as it goes up, of course, the RMB goes up. And you can see every time it's been at sort of this type of level, we've had an issue. Now, I, I wouldn't exactly say that that's going to happen now, but we saw in the gold oil ratio that that chart looks very similar to the RMB real effective exchange rate. You know, for me, macro is looking at all these different variables and looking at prices and seeing where there are strong correlations. And so you see it here um, that the economy is weak enough that we think it's going to lead to more RMB weakening. Again, the, pop, the Chinese population is aware of that. Um, I think that's going to support demand. And again, interest rates potentially are going to go to zero there. Um, you know, they don't have, uh, I think debt issuance also will increase. I mean, government debt to GDP is 20%. They could easily take that up to 100%. What does the savings rate look like in China? Oh, it's huge. I mean, they have, they still have a 50% savings ratio, if you can believe that. Wow. And it's seven to eight trillion dollars. So I think, I think also some of that will, you know, as the rates continue to drop, uh, the rates were just cut uh, at the G20 meeting. Uh, I, I think it was the PBOC governor who just came out and said, you know, we're going to not um, use the, uh, we're not going to uh, devalue the RMB as much, uh, even though slowly I think it can go down, but we're going to move to increase liquidity. And of course, I think that means uh, fiscal policy. They're going to issue more debt. And look, they have many projects, many things that they need to do. Uh, the environmental cleanup, in theory, they could spend a uh, trillion dollars doing that. I don't think that that's so, so crazy an assessment, and that's something they need. Um, there are many things that they need. A Silk Road project. A Silk Road project is one, and they can issue a lot of government debt. Okay. Um, at one second, at very low rates, and I think that's the key. If you're just like Japan, you can issue as much debt as you like at 25 basis points. It's not going to cost you anything, and it's AAA debt. So they've just opened the capital account um, for foreigners to come in and buy their uh, domestic uh, cash bond market. It's the second largest bond market in the world. People don't realize the total size of that market is $7 trillion. Um, I think only three of it is government debt. And at some point, that Chinese debt is going to be included in the uh, world bond indices. And so I think you'll have global fund managers coming in to buy that debt, uh, especially if there's an assurance on the currency. Um, and also, there are certain ways to hedge that currency. I think, you know, it would be pointless to encourage foreigners to come in to buy their local debt and then devalue on them. I mean, I know some people outside of China have a negative view. In theory, you can't trust the, the government. You can't trust them. 
I think that's completely wrong. Um, I think that they, their first priority is to become a, a, an economy that is a first, uh, I call first world economy on the same footing as Europe, the US, Japan. They're moving there. You know, you, you can't go from a non-capitalist uh, um, uh, economy to a fully capitalist economy overnight. And it's always going to have Chinese characteristics, um, which is a longer story to get into. Um, but the, the point of all this is that as they bring rates down lower, okay, which again is now a stated objective, you're going to have tremendous Chinese flow into gold because they're not going to want to sit with their savings at a zero interest rate. And they're going to look around for assets and maybe they buy, you know, high yielding corporate debt that has, you know, where there aren't that many, there aren't that many uh, rating agencies in China. I think only 15% of the debt is rated by foreign agencies like Moody's and S&P. So, you know, that's a lot of credit risk potentially. And the government debt uh, is going to yield, you know, maybe one, two percent. That might not be attractive. And there's going to be a lot of liquidity. You know, I step back big picture over three, four, five years. To me, that's going to be a very big driver and supporter of price.